Welcome. Hello. Lovely to see you all. Uh, I'm Martha. I am your trainer for today. I'm training on behalf of the Money Charity, on behalf of the Seafarers Charity, as part of the wider safety net campaign in this Financial Champions Supporting Fishers uh, piece of work for you all. Um, hopefully, as I said, today is going to be both enjoyable and informative for you all. Um, what we're about today is about helping you to help fishers to get the information that they need to manage their finances better. So it's not about you becoming incredible financial experts um, or, you know, perfect fountains of all knowledge, being able to give loads of, of great advice, but it is about you being able to point fishers in the right direction. Now, in order that we can tell something about how effective or otherwise this training is, um, I'm going to uh, do a quick poll with you all to find out how you are already, how confident you are already. And we'll do another poll at the end as well to see what's changed. So uh, quick poll right at the beginning. So we've got a spectrum here um, of different results. I'm just going to make a quick note of those. Um, but broadly, yeah, broadly, we've got a, a spectrum across the way um, of how people feel. And hopefully by the end, this is going to tilt more towards the people who feel really confident and feel good about their ability to support fishers with their finances. Bab, OK. Thank you very much. All right, so let's get going. Um, first of all, uh, I want to make sure that you all have a really great resource that we have put together to support you in what we're doing. So you're not going away thinking, oh, I'm going to have to learn all this stuff and then just remember it and I've got to have it all memorized. There's actually a nice resource that we've put together that you'll be able to download. Um, print off, keep to hand. So I'm just going to pop a link to that in your chat there. Um, and I'm sure that will be available from the Seafarers Charity in future as well when you need it. Um, I have popped the link in the chat there so you can download that resource. Um, but let's get on with the session because it is a packed session today. We want to try and get through everything. So it's 90 minutes plus another 15 minutes for Harriet, who is going to be talking about Safety Net Campaign, which is a broader campaign sits around this. Money Champions are part of a whole program of work to help fishers and people just in the fishing industry to improve their financial situation, but particularly fishers and uh, share fishermen in particular. Um, we will be taking questions in the chat. Um, it says questions in chat we answered at the end of the webinar. Um, to be honest, just throw them in there as we go through questions and thoughts. I love getting your feedback in the um, in the chat. So even if you just go in, do an emoji, give me a thumbs up as we're going. I love that. That's great. So digital handouts. I've already popped one in there once. Um, I'm going to, while I think about it, put another one in there that's that's really useful, which is a plain English guide to um, the language of money, to financial jargon, uh, which I really love. Um, honestly, half of dealing with your money is understanding the language, right? So put a nice little plain English guide to some of the money language that's out there. If you download those two, they're going to really help you out. Okay. Some expectation setting. We're not expecting you as money champions to perform miracles, right? Nobody's going to expect you to double a fish's income or suddenly make everybody who talks to you rich or um, suddenly give everybody perfect money skills from doing this. It's not about that. It's about giving you the ability to um, be supportive in the right, in a helpful way, in the right way, um, to give reliable information, to point people towards the right sources of information, the right sources of advice at the right time um, so that people get the help they need um, and fishers can, um, you know, have a first port of call, as it were, in you and you'll be able to then direct them onwards to some of the other really great advice and information that's out there for them. Okay, so um, 
here is what we are going to talk about. We're going to talk about the difference between giving financial advice and then what you're going to be doing, which is about support, information and guidance. Um, so where is that line into advice that you don't want to cross? We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about how do you stay the right side of that and just give information and guidance and support. We're going to talk about tax national insurance and how important that is. That's a major area where a lot of people who um, are fishing get into a lot of trouble. We're going to talk about signposting, fishers to tools and resources, uh, how to make a spending plan, how to help them smooth out their income, because we all know that fishing incomes rise, fall, they can be lumpy, they can be unpredictable, um, obviously they're seasonal. So all of those kind of things, just about a bit about smoothing that income out. Uh, we're going to talk about the idea of good and bad debt and how do we, um, you know, make sure that people stay away from bad debt and priority and non-priority debt. So if somebody doesn't have the money to cover all of their bills and expenses, what's the absolute essentials that they really need to make sure are covered, what's priority, and then where are the consequences less severe if they can't make that payment. Something about the cost of borrowing money as well. Uh, we're going to talk about credit unions a little bit and ComSave, which is the new credit union for the fishing industry, borrowing from licensed lenders and staying away from informal borrowing from friends and family, the risks that are around that. Um, and particularly loan sharks, the dangers of loan sharks in your community, how to spot them, what could do if you know that there is a loan shark in your local area. Some of the organisations providing independent free debt and money advice and how to signpost effectively to those so that the people you're speaking to get the advice that they need. OK, so starting off quick fire in the chat, why do you think it's so important? That fishers get the money skills, have the right money skills. Why do they need really good money skills? Put some of them, giving you some thoughts already, but what, why is it so important that they have really good money skills? Put your thoughts in the chat. Irregular income, yep. Yeah. Being self employed, yes. It's an unpredictable occupation. It's difficult to manage an irregular income, yep. Yeah, it's not consistent, exactly. Landings are not reliable, definitely. Though that's you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. That's the biggest one. Remaining solvent, especially if they have a family. Yes, definitely. Being able to plan ahead for bad markets. Definitely. All of those things, indeed, really, really important. And coming off the back of that, um, we also have lack of financial skills. Yeah, unpredictable rising costs of fuel. Yeah, hadn't had that one, but absolutely, that's important. Supporting an extended family network, potentially. Absolutely. Coming off the back of that, so we've got a whole bunch of things that have come away from that self-employment and unpredictable income. Um, there are aspects that where the income's unreliable even when you're fit and well, but you've got weather, injury, boat repairs, things that can knock somebody out of action for a while. And an unpredictable income leads to difficulty borrowing. It's very hard to have a good credit score when your income is unpredictable, which then leads to difficulty borrowing at a reasonable cost. Benefit systems not designed to work well with this kind of income um, and lifestyle. Um, and so there's a whole kind of raft of issues that come off from that irregular income and self-employment coming from loss of income. Yeah, loss of equipment, storms, etc. Being responsible for tax NI, all of that stuff, planning for retirement. Yeah, it's hard to do all of that stuff for yourself. There's not an employer doing it for you. Um, and yeah, so there's a whole raft of things that mean that fishers need to be above average in terms of how competent they are and how determined they are to manage their money well. So if you needed to talk to somebody about your money, what would you want? So you're going to be there to be a person that people will talk to about their money. What kind of treatment would you want if you're going to have talk to somebody about your money? How do you want to be treated by that person? Be listened to. Yes, absolutely. Super important. What else? Be listened to and to be understood. Yeah. Honesty. Yeah. 
Yeah. Empathy, non-judgment, respect. Great answers coming through in the chat here as an adult. Yeah, you don't want to be patronized, right? Empathetic, knowledgeable, not a salesperson. Really important, right? Discretion. Yeah, privacy is a big deal, right? With money, you need an expert. Okay. I'm going to say something. You need somebody who, in with that honesty, says, this is what I know, this is what I don't know, and this is can refer to an expert, doesn't try and blag it and say that they know more than they do. Communicating in language I understand, absolutely. Confidential, simple, straightforward words, all of that, absolutely. One of the reasons why the first thing I did was to give you that plain English jargon buster, um, because it's so important to be speaking people's language. Yeah, fantastic. All of this is really great. Um, so, here are some top tips about having a good conversation about money. We want to speak in private. Make sure we're going to be really clear that we're going to keep anything personal confidential. We're not trying to make any personal gain out of this. So we're not um, being a salesperson, as somebody said. We're listening carefully. We're not assuming anything about somebody's situation. We're just acting on what they tell us. So not trying to get ahead of ourselves. Being honest, say how you can help, how you can't help, when you can refer, who else could be helpful not pushing somebody towards a specific solution, you're letting them choose. And that's part of that. Yeah, don't overpromise and underdeliver. Definitely. Exactly. Part of that treating people like an adult is about giving them the choice, right? So we're not just saying this is the right thing for you to do. Just go on and do what I tell you because I'm telling you what to do. No, we're giving them the range of options, the pros and cons of those options, and then letting them choose because they're responsible for what they're going to do. Simple, clear explanations, referring to experts when necessary. And we're looking at the future. Lots of people said empathy and lack of and non-judgment. So we're not judging what people have done in the past. You might think, oh, how could you get into a mess like that? But that's not what it's about. It's about future actions, supporting people to make responsible, wise choices for their future from now on. So many people who come for money advice are so ashamed and so hard on themselves already that actually, you know, you getting on top of them as well is you're only adding on to that. It's not helpful. Step by step supporting them through. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody to be with them through it as much as you can, although we don't expect you to um, put huge amounts of time into any specific person's case and kind of take over doing everything with them. But, you know, like as within your role, you know, being supportive, being there for them. OK, so sounds like you're really on this. That's fantastic. OK, so let's talk about this guidance advice issue. This is really important. I want to get this to you straight away right at the top. So advice, financial advice is a regulated term. So let's talk about the difference between guidance and giving advice. Financial advice is what financial advisors, planners, um, and people who are in, a re in regulated financial advice in financial services do. Debt advisors also have to be regulated and they give advice. So where you see that word advice in somebody's job role around money, they should be authorised, regulated, and properly qualified by the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, and the reason is because advice is about giving somebody a recommendation about what they should do. So it's a tailored solution based on somebody's personal circumstances, based on their objectives, based on what they've said they want. And it's specific. It says you should take out a specific product or stop using a specific product or um, you should go to a specific provider. It's, um, it's all about that. You should take this solution. And not only are we saying don't do it because you have to be authorized, you have to be regulated, you have to be properly insured, all of that stuff. Yes. But it's also about responsibility, right? So when you give advice, a person who gives advice in a financial sense, gives advice, is to some extent taking on the responsibility for that being the right advice. Whereas what we want you to do is to give guidance. And with guidance, the person, the, the other person retains the responsibility for the choice they make. 
Okay, so what is guidance? Let's talk about the other side of it. This is what we want you to do. Guidance helps a person to understand what they could do. So advice, this is what you should do. This is the solution for you. We think this is the right thing. Guidance, on the other hand, as opposed to advice, a guidance says these are some things that you could do. These are the advantages and disadvantages of those some general types of products, some general principles. Um, it, there is no personal recommendation. There is no specific solution offered. It's just these are potential options for you. Let's help you understand those, what's good and what's not so good about them. And then you can make a decision about what's right for you. It's not regulated. Anybody can give guidance. Um, and so because it's not about you taking the responsibility for giving for what, what the net person does, because you're not spe specifically saying one solution. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody, what that difference is. Um, so we're gonna do a quick, uh, a quick kind of run through of the, the whys, which I've talked about a bit already. Um, and then we'll do a quick poll and you can, confirm to me that you have got this. Um, so I've already said giving advice makes you responsible. I've already mentioned about the regulated advisors aspect. A couple of things as well. Guidance helps fishers learn to solve their own problems in future. So guidance is more educational than advice. With advice, often the person who's seeking advice goes, just take this problem away from me. And the advisor goes, yeah, sure. I've taken the problem away from you. Here's the solution. Um, whereas guidance helps the person learn to solve their own problems in future. And when a person makes a choice for themselves, as they do in a guidance situation, it's like it's their choice. They own it. They're responsible for it. There's no pushback of, oh, well, this person told me to do it, but actually I don't like it. So I'm not going to bother. You don't get that, that pushback aspect. So psychologically, there's um, an element of the responsibility taking that can be really valuable too. Okay. So quick poll let's see do we think this is advice or do we think this is guidance and it's okay so a fisher tells you they've been saving money for emergencies in drawer in their house and you say uh -uh, that's not safe what if it gets stolen you have to get a savings account you should get a savings account with halifax they're nice in there talk to sherry she's great she'll get you a good deal so uh quick poll is that advice or is that guidance Remember advice, it's all about telling people what they should do. Guidance is about telling people what they could do. So guidance is the one we want to stick with. Advice is the one we want to stay away from. Okay. Three, two, one. I'm going to close the poll. Um, and here we go. Most people have got that right. Um, this is advice you want to stick well clear of this. In this, uh, we're telling the person where to go, what product to get, we're telling them what bank to go to, we're even telling them what advisor to speak to in the bank. So that's very much specific, tailored advice. And that's what we want to steer well clear of. Okay, so definitely that is advice. Um, so let's do another one of these, just to make sure you've got it. Uh, we have a fisher come to us and they say they need to get a personal loan. They think the bank's not going to lend them the money. They say, what would you do? You say, well, I can't say I'm not in that position, in your position, but I can talk to you about some of the things that you could do. Um, here's some information about how to choose a loan with low fees and interest rates. You show them how to use a comparison site, potentially. You also mentioned that ComSave Credit Union exists and it has a specific product for fishers. Um, and the fisher looks at the offers on the comparison site, has a chat with ComSave. In the end, they think ComSave is the right thing for them and they borrow from ComSave. So is that advice or is that guidance?
And Tina has put the ComSave link into the chat. Thank you very much, Tina. That's fantastic. Okay, give me another couple of seconds. Get those answers in there as quick as possible. Do, 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 do. Okay, okay, keep it moving. Right, three, two, one, boom. And there we go. Again, almost everybody got that one right. That is guidance. So even though we have said, mentioned a specific provider, all we've done is say they exist, right? We haven't said they're the right thing for you. We haven't said they're the only solution. Um, and many fishers will not know about the existence of ComSafe. So because they don't know that that exists, they would not otherwise have that as an option. So we're just saying like, look, these are, these options exist and then this option also exists that does have a specific product but I'm not saying it's the right thing I'm just saying it exists and advantages and disadvantages so you're okay with that it is within the guidance um, and you're all right to do that and as I said Tina has already dropped the link in there so Fab thank you very much Tina um all right so let's talk about some quickly some frustrations. Sometimes uh, people really want advice. They just want to be told what to do. Um, and it can be really tempting, especially when there is one really clear, obvious choice that's the right thing for somebody to do. Very tempting to just tell them, look, just do this. But you cannot do it. You can't even just hint. And people will do things like say, um, well, what would you do? And you have to say, well, I'm not you. So our situation is different, so I can't tell you it's your choice. So make sure you're always batting that back to that person. Ultimately, they have to be responsible for their own decision. You're guiding, you're supporting, but you cannot recommend a specific course of action um, with regards to products. Okay, um, these are some signs from step change that you might want to watch out for um, that somebody is struggling financially. So as a money champion, you're going to want to kind of be aware of these signals that this might be somebody that you want to just check in with, make sure they're okay. So history of debt problems, seeming tired, difficulty sleeping, debt stress often causes people to have sleepless nights, doesn't want to get together, sort of spending more time by themselves, borrowing to pay for food or essentials, if you know something that might cause a recent loss of income, they seem to be way living beyond their means um, and the, in the income you know of and their lifestyle don't match up. If they're borrowing early, um, soon after a catch, soon after getting paid, um, or you see kind of changes in behavior that imply somebody's struggling. Um, and again, you know, you might not personally see this, but if you notice that their bills are unopened or they're being really cagey around money, that might be a sign too. Okay, so spending plans as opposed to budgets. We avoid the B word just because a lot of people have negative associations with it. A spending plan sounds like something somebody might want to do as opposed to a budget, which lots of people don't want to do. But, um, you know, it's up to you. We have in the uh, document that I've already put into the chat once, but I'm going to do it again. And in the... Um, go but there it is make sure everybody gets that download uh, and in all the resources that you will get from the safety net later um, there's a nice planning sheet to help people to plan their money um, to make a spending plan for matching and making sure that their outgoings are not higher than their incoming uh, understanding where their money is going and how they can plan not just for the day-to-day -day bills, but also for those occasional expenses that come up that can really throw people. So things that knock people's spending out of whack, apart from an unexpectedly long time between um, ability to earn, things that throw people, things like uh, birthdays, Christmas, you'd think um, because they come around the same time every year, you'd expect people to have the money for them, but no, lots of people don't plan in their spending plans for those things. And actually it's really important they do, which is one of the reasons why this budget planner sheet, which looks super detailed and a bit intimidating to some people, it's not, it's just there to remind you of all those things that you might otherwise forget, like MOTs, like boat insurance. We haven't got boat insurance in there because it's a generic one, but we do have insurance annual insurance payments in there 
and boat insurance is probably got to be in in the high uh, top ones for those um, things like you know household repairs and replacements those sort of throw people out of whack so those occasional expenses making sure that there's money going aside every month so that when those big things come round, as they do maybe once every six months once a year there's something in the pot already for them and we're not scrambling and cutting back on everything else that month um there is also an online money charity bunny budget builder so people who don't want to have to do the maths themselves which you have to do with a paper form can um find online planners that will do it for you they do all your maths all you do is plug in the right numbers um which you should use uh the real figures really important when you're talking to um fishers about planning their spending that they have to use the actual real numbers from their own bills, from their bank statements, um, from their receipts, and not just optimistically make it up, because otherwise it's not a plan, it's just a daydream, right? Got to make sure it's based on real numbers. There are lots of other places online that you can also get these things. So Money Helper, fantastic website, loads of free information, completely independent, um, run by the government. So it's it's just a completely independent from all financial services it's not trying to sell you anything um, and that has loads of information and that includes a budget planner citizens advice which you may well have heard of um, they have a budget planner an online one as well where you can plug your figures in um, money saving expert which is a for-profit website um, but it does have loads of great free information they have a good really detailed budget planner something that can be downloaded as a spreadsheet or i think there might be one you can work on online as well um, so there's loads of great options on there. Um, and it's really just about finding the one that works for that person, right? Everybody has their own personal preferences about what they like. There are also loads of really good mobile apps as well, some of which um, access your uh, bank details on a kind of read-only basis. And they pretty much like download your latest transactions and then sort the data out. So anything that's from Tesco's gets sorted into a groceries category, for example. Um, make sure if anybody's going to use a mobile app that they understand the terms and conditions what they're signing up to they're happy with the privacy and security of that app um, and i i would suggest don't recommend any specific apps um, because a lot of them now come with financial products attached to them which means you're edging into that area of am i giving advice um, but you can certainly tell people that there are lots of these apps exist and they can be really helpful okay hopefully you're all good all gone really quiet in the chat again so give me a thumbs up say hi um if there is um anything that you want to give me any thoughts on what we've said so far let's talk about boosting income and cutting costs because it's all very well making a plan but you have to make that plan balance and do the best you can to have the income side going up and the cost sides lower so that we're not in an unbalanced situation and spending more than we have coming in so first place to look i'd suggest if people um, need to get an income boost is turn to us.org.uk we'll look at that a little bit more a bit later on in the training turn to us is a website with loads of information about benefits um, and just raising income in general um, especially anybody with a family or a young family should get in the habit of checking their benefits entitlement at least once a year um unless you're on a really comfortable income and i know there are plenty of fishers who do earn a really comfortable income it's a good idea to check regularly because the system changes all the time so what somebody's entitled to might change and you could miss out if you're not checking regularly so you can do that, do a personalised check, find out what you're entitled to. Um, I know we've got some great people from Fisherman's Mission here, local Fisherman's Mission um, representatives, uh, potentially can help with applying for grants. Um, so if somebody's really struggling and um, potentially a charitable grant might be a, a good solution for them, um, for example, to meet some, you know, one off unexpected expense. Um, that could be a solution for them. I know that there are opportunities sometimes for grants to get things like fuel bills written off if somebody's got fuel arrears, um, as in as in electricity and gas arrears or, or um, home uh, oil 
heating arrears. Um, I know that uh, water arrears can sometimes be written off. Um, sometimes you can get educational grants, grants for white goods, things like washing machines, cookers. So there's lots of availability potentially out there. And um, Fishmish can be, as I gather you're called, can be a really good place to go for help with some of that stuff. We always suggest that people have separate email accounts for things like online shopping, deals and competitions, as opposed to like personal communications. So that if you're trying to email about something um, that's just like personal, that you're having a, a chat with somebody somehow, um, if you still use email for that, um, you're keeping that separate from all the marketing emails that you might get from online shopping, deals, competitions, that kind of thing. And so you're not accidentally getting drawn into spending money when you weren't intending to but do keep an eye on things like shopping deals and competitions because there can be ways to get some income through being on a newsletter or a mailing list that you would otherwise miss um, check out cashback sites like quidco and top cashback if you have an account with those you use those click through from those to somewhere that where you're going to do your shopping so you choose what you're going to buy first already and then use your Quidco account, click through, or your top cashback account and click through and buy the thing you were already going to buy. Don't use it as an excuse to buy something you weren't already going to buy. And you can get cash back on your purchases, often in the realms of somewhere around, it's only one to 3%. Sometimes it can be higher. Um, but those cashbacks can add up quite quickly, particularly if you're buying bigger things. Um, so yeah, they can, that could be a really helpful kind of ongoing little drip drip of extra money. Um, sometimes you can get online competitions that could be quite valuable. Again, um, it's not a reliable source of income, but it can be quite nice. And um, it's amazing the things that you can sell on eBay and Facebook. I've known people who have sold, um, you know, big packets of, of um, they've saved their empty toilet tubes <laughs> and sold all the, a big pack of toilet tubes as, as um, craft materials, for example. Um, so it's amazing what can be sold on eBay and Facebook, um, on Facebook Marketplace. Um, you would not think people would buy stuff, but but it's amazing when you look what people will buy. Okay. Um, I mentioned already Turn to Us as being a really useful website. This is what the site looks like. So it's um, a national charity for helping people with income. I want to particularly highlight the fact there is this benefits checker on here. Um, and um, this is well worth pointing out as well that people can have set up an account so that if they don't have all the numbers and information they need when they're going through the benefits check the first time, um, they can have an account and come back um, and uh, you know continue a calculation at a later point so that they're not um, you know they don't have to sit down and do it all at once in, in one shot and have all of their information at the same time. Um, some others that can be useful, Seafarer support is quite a useful source of information as well, can be a little out of date from time to time and applying for the grants that you might find on there is hard work. So Fisherman's Mission or Sail would be um, my ports of call for uh, actually making any kind of applications, but just to check out and see whether there might be something, this is a useful website as a potential source of information. And then we've got some fab websites for helping to make your money go further. Um, all of these would be a really good places to look for information about money saving of different kinds, which I think a lot of people know about which. So if you want to understand financial products, you want simple explanations, what on earth is an ISA, which has a good in set of a rundown of information about what is nicer. They also do best buys for lots of different types of products. So if you want to make sure that so your buying is value for money, it's good quality, which is often a really good place to look for that. Money saving expert, already mentioned it already, you might recognize Martin Lewis from the telly. Um, it's one of the ugliest websites on, on the internet, but it's also absolutely crammed with really great information and often very good for latest breaking news around money issues for ordinary people. So um, what do I do? My, my gas bill is about to rise because of the fuel crisis right now. Money saving expert probably has some good information to help understand what your options are and what might be a good solution there. Um, 
Yeah, so which so some of it is free, some of it's not free. I would say the information articles are often free, but whether the best buy stuff is less likely to be. So I think they're good for like basic information, but you're right, there there's um, a lot that's also behind a paywall. That's true. Um, Freegal and FreeCycle. Um, if you haven't heard of these, these are local community groups. You sign up for your group in your local area. And people who have something to give away, often items of furniture, kitchenware. Um, I got a tent, a brand, almost brand new tent to go camping with um, for free. People give away stuff when they have a clear out on Freegal and FreeCycle. And potentially there's the opportunity to get some stuff for free. Or if you're having a clear out, you can get rid of things without having to pay for somebody to take it away. Um, as long as what you're giving away is uh, in reasonable condition, somebody might actually want it. So those can be good to know about. Um, or if you don't have one in your local area, maybe look into whether or not starting one might be popular. Parkopedia is like uh, comparison shopping for parking. So if you're going somewhere, you don't know what the parking's like where you're going, you want to park as affordably as possible, Parkopedia can point you to the most affordable parking where you're going to. Idealo is price comparison for all sorts of retail shopping. So if there's something you want to buy, you know the brand, you know the item, put it into Idealo, find out where online you can buy it for the cheapest. Camel, camel, camel. Amazon prices rise and fall for different goods. So you can find out whether something on Amazon is expensive right now or if it's cheap right now and buy it when the price is cheapest. And then train split is a way of getting cheap, cheap train tickets cheap train tickets say that three times fast um, by splitting your journey up so instead of going end to end just on one ticket you buy back-to-back -back tickets for sections of the journey um, and that can end up being cheaper because our railway system is complicated and confusing and weird um, but potentially a way to save money on those kinds of journeys if um, somebody you're talking to does have to make a train journey Okay, so keeping track. There's no point doing all of this stuff if you don't know whether it's working. So no point having a plan if you're not tracking progress against the plan. No point doing all this boosting income and trying to shop as savvily as possible if you're not then actually um, keeping track of what the benefit of that has all been for you. So. We've got on here some suggested ways in which uh, fishers can try to um, keep track of their of their money. And these have pros and cons. Um, each of them has their benefits and uh, issues. Is there any on here, stick an idea in chat, any on here that immediately makes you think, oh yeah, I'd want to do that. If so, say which one it is and why. And any in there that you think, oh no, I definitely don't want to do that. If so, why would you not want to use it? and which one is it so let us know only spending cash okay so is only spending cash a good thing or a not so not so good thing and why what what appeals or doesn't appeal about only spending cash you're not keeping all the receipts um why not why do you not want to keep all your receipts <laughs> what's the what's the struggle cash for many fishermen yeah, I think I think a lot of fishermen find using cash um, potentially helpful. Would not do the tracking work. Ah, yeah. OK, so it's very easy if you're just um, keeping all your receipts to just then stick them in an envelope somewhere and not not actually use them to do the tracking. Like, oh, I'm keeping my receipts. I'm doing what I need to do, but you're not actually looking at them. Um, you have to keep receipts for your plan. Budgeting on a phone so you're not lose. You can't lose a paper notebook. Yeah, definitely. It's easy to forget a notebook, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. OK, fantastic. So they all have their pros and cons, right? An open pen is great if you use it. It never runs out of battery. But on the other hand, if you forget it, or you forget to write something down. It's not there. On the other hand, a budgeting app could be great, but you have to have signal, you have to have data um, and your phone has to be charged. So there's pros and cons to everything. Um, but there's lots of different good options out there and different people um be much happier just spending cash think it might be habit even after the last 18 months it's comfortable at the end if you don't have the cash you can't spend it exactly receipts for the accountant at the end of the year now that's really important we're going to come on to tax in a minute yeah 
uh, cash, you can't pretend how much you haven't spent. Now, that's one of the issues with tapping your card all the time, isn't it? It's easy to pretend to yourself you're not really spending. OK, so I want to get on to kind of this smoothing income out issue. So if you are planning effectively and particularly you're planning ahead for those occasional expenses, that will work. But um, it is something that fishers need to pay special attention to is this idea of smoothing income and cash flow. Um, a lot of people that, you know, the thinking is I've made my money. This is great. Now I've, this is what I've got to spend. But actually, if you're going to shift to that money mindset that um, you need to be in to live effectively on this kind of income, it needs to be I've made my money now. What am I going to do with this to have a better future? What do I need to put aside to build myself the life I want to build? So um, this is what we're trying to encourage. If somebody is not already doing this, we want to encourage them, first of all, as a beginning step to start each month with the essential expenses already in the bank for that month. So nobody's trying to catch up with themselves, basically trying to stay ahead of their bills. No hand to mouth, right? That way, the person knows exactly what they can afford to spend. They're not in a race against time to earn what they need. So the first step that we want, get, want to get people to is starting each month with the essential expenses already in the bank, ready to go. Um, and then we want to have this life happens fund, otherwise known as an old bleep fund. <laughs> um, or if we're going to be more genteel about it, a rainy day fund. But life happens fund. Um, ideally, we want to have at least two months essential expenses in there, preferably three to six months because somebody might get injured um, or, you know, there are all sorts of things that can happen to a person um, that could put them out of action for longer than that. And I know, again, if somebody's um, in a particularly seasonal area, then, you know, putting that three to six months aside when times are good to get them through the the winter with bad weather or or whatever that is whatever the off season is that's really really important so understanding that you need to have a life happens fund and really encouraging fishers to do that it's really important put that money in as part of the plan yeah income cycle greatly season season it is really difficult yeah oh somebody's put using a credit card which gives points back Yes, great if um, you pay that credit card off every month. So because the minute you don't pay it off one month, the chances are the interest you're going to pay on the uh, uncovered um, balance, on the carried over balance, is going to knock all of the points out of action that you'd otherwise saved. Um, so yes, credit cards with points can be great, um, but they also can be a bit dangerous as well. It's all about that management, isn't it? OK, so life happens funds, super important. Um, something that can be useful for some of the more savvy people um, is some of the challenger banks. Again, we can't point somebody to a specific bank, um, but Starling and Monzo and some of the other challenger banks. And nowadays, some of the high street banks as well are beginning to do this, have this idea of pots or spaces or goals. And these are like little mini savings accounts that sit alongside the current account and you can give them a name. Um, and they can be really useful for helping somebody who easily forgets what their saved money is for. Um, and reminds them, oh, this is the money that I'm putting aside for birthdays, or this is the money I'm putting aside for life happens. This is the money I'm putting aside in case the fridge breaks, because some piece of the white goods will probably break in the next two years. So you want to have something. OK, um, so use a charge card, must pay off. Exactly. It's all about you have to pay it off. So, yes. Pot spaces and goals, some people do find them very, very helpful. Um, I would suggest it's something certainly to look at. And so here is, we've got a nice little slide of the um, journey from a complete financial chaos to <laughs> kind of in a really good place. Um, and I wanted to put this in here so that we can see that it is a journey, right? We're going from I have next week spending already in the bank. 
I have next month spending already in the bank. I have occasional spends covered, two months spending covered for that life happens. And now I can build further, look further on into the future. It's a process. People go through steps. You don't just have this all or nothing of it's either chaos or it's brilliant and people are only into one or the other, right? It's a journey forward to becoming good with money. Um, here is a little tip for some people who find that money really burns a hole in their pocket, right? So some people, what, however good their plan is, however good their intentions are, they just find that like when they have money, it tends to go. And if you are dealing with somebody who's in that position, something that can be helpful is to over, buy extra phone credit, overpay potentially a little bit on gas and electric, um, overpay potentially a bit on the water or TV license and buy non-perishable expense uh, essential goods so not on this slide your apples <laughs> your green vegetables your fresh things like that but toilet roll tea bags canned goods uh rice and pasta um things that are not going to go off if somebody is a bit spendy it's actually quite helpful to you know stock up on um some of the basics and then you know that those basics are covered um, and, you know, it, it's a bit more reassuring if you've then potentially got a bit of time to wait before the next chunk comes in. Um, we're very specific on here about which bills it's okay to overpay. Some things that you should never overpay, never overpay private rent, because you're not going to get that back um, if you need to. These things that we've listed on here, potentially you could get that back if you really needed to. So you can request a refund for a lot of these, um, but not, for example, on private rent. So um, potentially, you know, overpaying a bit, gas, electric, water, TV license, you might be able to get a refund if you really needed to, um, but you would never be able to do that, almost certainly not on private rent. So, you know, be careful about what you do. But yeah, stocking up on essentials can be a good way to manage that rising, falling income. Plus, also, you may get a discount on bulk buying as well. So it's actually one of the times you can use it to your advantage. Let's talk tax and national insurance. We know this is an area where a lot of fishers get into trouble. So let's do it. Um, OK. So we have got here a wonderful video um, which has been put together for us by the Seafarers Charity. So thank you very much. With a bit of guidance, taking the step to becoming a self-employed fisher can be easy and rewarding. At the fish market, all your hard work is turned into income. Fishmongers can buy all the top quality fish you've landed. As a self-employed share fisherman, like thousands of others, you need to manage that income. It's not hard and the advice here will help you on your way to understanding what's involved. This film takes a look at what you need to consider when paying your tax. I've been fishing from Newquay all my life. Since the age of about seven, I come down the harbour and I've been here ever since. I've got two shellfish boats fishing for lobsters and crabs as a mainstay and a couple of months of the year we'll fish for a few pollock and rays and turbot got two sons both running the boats. We land our catch most days as we come in, fresh on the quay to different merchants all around Cornwall. Usually if we land between a Friday and a Friday, we get paid on the Saturday. It's backed into our account every Saturday or Sunday afternoon. And then we'll get an email with the landing ticket. My sons make a note of what we catch on the boat in a diary. They then pass that information on to me via a text message. Then goes to the merchant who then will send me an email confirmation of my weights which obviously the MMO get copied the same day I then got my wife who does my main paperwork she then enters it all onto a spreadsheet and I also enter it into another diary for my own records just so I know I've got that third copy in case things go missing my crew get paid through a percentage I will take the bait and the diesel allowance right off the top of the grossing before anything else comes out and then they get a share of that grossing from that amount. 
and I'll also take a share for the boat and a share for the gear. Every week our grossings, bills, anything we buy, anything we get in, all goes on our spreadsheet, which the wife puts on the computer. She emails that information every single week over to my accountant. You can also ask others about how they manage their tax. You will eventually work out what works best for you. I'm Kelly and I'm one of the accountants at Big Staff & Co in Hale in Cornwall. And we deal with a lot of people that work within the fishing and marine industry, crew, fishermen, boat owners, skippers, and we try to help them comply with their obligations with HMRC. Self-employed fishermen are under the same obligations as any other self-employed person, so they're required to submit a tax return to HMRC every year and pay any tax and national insurance contributions that are due. We try to make things as easy as possible for them to comply with all their legal obligations. We can advise them as to what records they need to keep, how they need to keep them, whether that's just invoices in a shoebox that they drop in at the end of each year. There are lots of financial and bookkeeping apps like QuickBooks out there these days. So as soon as a piece of paper comes their way, they can just photo it and it's all stored in the cloud for their accountant to deal with. If they don't really want to get involved with using technology, apps, things like that, is every time they get a receipt or a piece of paper from maybe the crew settlement figures, things like that, just to pile it all together, maybe in a bag or a shoebox, and make sure that they keep everything in one place. If you need help finding an accountant, ask around. There is often someone who will know a good local accountant. If you want to complete your tax return yourself, you can do this at gov.uk. The website contains detailed information about tax, national insurance and how to do your self-assessment. Remember to look for information that particularly relates to share fishermen. To set up and submit a tax return, you'll need your national insurance number. You can find details as to how to find out your national insurance number on the government website. HMRC will then open an account and send you a letter with details about how to activate it. Then you're ready to go. Remember, you must keep records throughout the year of your income and expenses from your fishing. You'll need these to complete your return. If you don't feel comfortable doing your own self-assessment, day to day, if I have a problem at any time of the year, the providing it's in work hours, I can pick up the phone to my accountant, email or text, and get information and answers. So how much does accountancy cost? The range of costs for accountancy fees for completing tax returns and accounts for people that work within the fishing industry can vary greatly and it depends on the complexity of the job. For a share fisherman who is just working as crew and just getting maybe one monthly or bi-weekly income, few expenses, you'd be looking at a few hundred pounds. This will rise for the more complex situations. If you've got a boat owner with a fleet of boats, for example, that registered, obviously that would be more costly. The money you pay in income tax pays for the public services that we all use, such as the National Health Service and the payment of welfare benefits. It is very important that you pay your tax bill on time. If you do not and cannot make an alternative arrangement to pay, HMRC can take enforcement action to recover any tax you owe. This could include financial penalties, collecting what you owe through your earnings or pension, asking debt collectors to collect the money, taking you to court, or even making you bankrupt. This could have an impact on your state pension, access to welfare benefits, and also affect your ability to get a car loan or mortgage. We have seen quite a few fishermen that have come to us because they have fallen behind. They either haven't registered in time with HMRC or they haven't submitted tax returns for a few years. If the income tax is not paid on time or not paid at all, the HMRC can come after you with penalties. And if you don't respond correctly to those penalties, then you can go down the route of getting more serious sanctions. And in extreme circumstances, if you don't pay willfully, they can prosecute. But don't worry, there is help at hand. Everything can be sorted. We make the whole process easy so that we can get them registered if that's, that's the outstanding issue, get them up to date with their tax returns and let them know what their tax liabilities are so they can settle them as soon as possible. And it's not just accountants who may be able to help you. There are other organisations who are dedicated to helping fishers and seafarers when things go wrong and you feel you may be in crisis. Your first port of call if you find yourself in financial trouble is Sale, a 
free citizens advice service that helps seafarers, fishers and their families. We have a team of expert advisors who can offer you free, impartial and confidential advice. We get quite a lot of calls from fishermen who, whose finances are in a bit of a mess. Quite often that's to do with the HMIC and not paying income tax. Sale is here to help in broad terms with finances. A fisherman's income goes up and down and that can be a real challenge in terms of monitoring your expenditure and keeping on top of debts. The earlier that you deal with these problems, the better. And Sale is definitely here to help you sort out these problems completely free of charge. You can contact us either by calling through email or we also offer video chat. Just get in touch with us and we'll be happy to follow up with you and put you through the next steps in the process. Nothing is so far gone that it can't be recovered. We'll deal with HMRC with everything that's outstanding and also try and mitigate any penalties as far as possible. I would say just get an accountant involved from the beginning, then you're not going to get behind with your tax affairs. You're not going to be under the issue of late payment penalties or late submission penalties. Great. So apologies for, um, for video jumping, but as Tina said in the chat there, you will have an opportunity to watch that again. That will be on the Safety Net um, website for you to see again. And you, I think you've got the key points here. Really important to register as a self-employed share fisherman, not just as registering as self-employed. Pay those national insurance invoices regularly. Keep the payments up to date to get day one benefits. And um, here we go, just a second. There we go. Um, make sure that everybody is putting money aside every time they get paid, keeping good records, keeping that tax and NI money ideally in a second secondary account so they're not going to spend it by accident, um, using an accountant and getting help early if they are confused or worried. I will also say HMRC are not the enemy. Um, it can be easy to get into kind of an antagonistic relationship with them. But actually, there's lots of advice and information directly from HMRC themselves. They, they do nowadays try much harder to make the process of paying them a lot easier um, than they used to perhaps in the past. So they do even do things like webinars and they have a newsletter. So it's, some useful information can be had directly from them themselves. Uh, is that guidance to say people should um, keep their taxes in a separate account? It's That still counts as, I think you can say that as guidance. It's a good idea to keep your taxes in a separate account. Yes. Specifying what that separate account is or keeping where you keep it separate, then we're beginning to cross into advice, but it's a good idea to keep your tax and NI money completely separate from your spending money. Yeah, you can say that. That's guidance. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we've got all of that there. Let's talk credit borrowing and debt um, as quickly as possible because we're going to run behind otherwise and we do not have a lot of time. Okay, borrowing, there's a load, a bunch of different products available for people to borrow um, and the types of products available are changing all the time because of uh, modern technology, things like buy now, pay later, which lots of people don't think of as debt. You think of it as just spreading the cost. Well, anything that spreads the cost puts you into debt. So anytime you get the goods first and pay for them afterwards, you've had credit, you are in debt. So uh, lots of things that people don't think about that are actually a way of borrowing. Um, and the booklet that we gave you gives some good information about understanding these different types of credit. It is a good idea for your own information to go and get your heads around how some of these different types of credit work. We haven't got time during this session to really um, go into them in a lot of detail, but the Money Helper website in particular and the booklet that we've shared with you give some good information about understanding these different types of credit, just getting the basics of what they how they work and what they do. Um, it is a good idea to ha sort of have an idea. Yeah, people don't think of catalogues with their weekly, monthly payments as debts, but they are exactly, exactly. Overdraft is a type of debt as well. Um, In-store credit is a type of debt. All of these things, anytime higher purchase, anytime you are having use of the thing, whether it's a good or service first, and then paying afterwards, 
you are in effect in debt. You've acted as if you've borrowed money to do that. So people don't necessarily think of that, but they are all different types of debt. And um, we say that there are sort of ideas of like good and bad debt. Um, can anybody think about what we might think of as like bad debt? So why are some unwise reasons to borrow money? What are some not so great reasons to borrow money? Okay, so Lizanne will we'll come into, um, Claire, you will be able to, yes, you will be able to access this afterwards. That's why we're recording it. Yes. Um, so we, yeah, so get something you want rather than something you need to go on holiday. Yes, those are some unwise reasons um, to go to bide you over to payday. So yeah, exactly. So not having planned and then borrowing to for essentials is going to put you in more difficulty. Next month, you're going to end up with not only the essentials to pay for, but also the interest from the debts and the debt repayments. So exactly all of those things, buying things you want rather than things you need, paying for essentials and um, things like going on holiday, like fun spending are often not a great use of borrowed money. What about good debt? What might classify as good debt? Again, answers in the chat. Give me some suggestions of good debt. Mortgage, yep. Pitching an asset like a house, yes. Yep. Utilities. Um, so what do you mean by utilities? A debt that's serviced and not in arrears. Things that will build, earning or develop a business to earn more money long-term. Yeah, car loan for transport, potentially. That's a controversial one, um, but it can be. Yeah, depends if you get a good deal. Rent. So rent is, um, yeah, not getting, like, if you're using your house and you're paying your rent a month in arrears, then I guess so, yes. Insurance can be um, to keep the lights on. Ideally, that's not good debt. You know, ideally, you don't want to do that. A well-managed reward card paid every paid off every month absolutely is good debt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So bad debt is all about unaffordable borrowing, borrowing for essentials and just borrowing for things that are like um, to tide you over where you're going to end up in more trouble later. Good debt is all about the borrowing costs less than the benefit that you're going to get in the future. So um, you're getting an asset, you're building a business. It's something that will help you to increase your earning power. That's good debt. Okay, fantastic. Well done. Superb. Okay, quick, quick rundown of what APR is. Does anybody know what APR is? Can anybody give me a definition of APR? Annual percentage rate. Well done, Susan. Yeah, fantastic. Annual percentage rate. It is a standardized way of comparing how fast a form of borrowing is growing, how fast are interest and charges being added to this outstanding balance of your loan. So we're going to do a little comparison to understand the effects of APR. So if we compare 500 pounds paid off at 60 pounds a month, two different APRs, we're going to put up a poll and see if you can um, grasp how much longer will it take to pay off um, the loan at 250 as opposed to 29.9 and how much more is the total cost how much you're going to more are you going to pay off in total if you're paying at that higher APR so here we go um, have a go at that poll see what you have to say so how much more is it going to cost you and how much longer is it going to take you to pay off um, a doorstep loan at 250% as opposed to a credit card at 29.9%. See how fast you can do this. It's not, it's not a uh, test. It's not an exam. So just put your answers down as fast as you can.
it's all right to guess it. Is that it? Is everybody, is that everybody who's going to answer? It's okay, you can just guess. We're not, it's not a test. Don't worry, you're not going to fail. <laughs> just give it a go. All right. Okay, is that everybody who's going to do it? Three, two, one. There we go. Okay, so let's share those results. Um, so most people have the right answers here. It is the biggest and longest times to pay and the biggest amount. So it does take an extra year and two months um, to pay off the doorstep loan. And it does take an extra 872 pounds. So here we go. Times to pay. 10 months is the time to pay. Um, on the credit card, or is it'll take two years to pay off that doorstep loan at that rate. The total repayable on the card, where well, you're only really making essentially one extra payment's worth of interest, whereas the cost is nearly three times as much on that doorstep loan as the amount borrowed. So it's pretty hair raising the difference that APR can make. Yeah. Um, how to work out APR. So APR is extremely complicated. You do not need to work it out. The good news is it is a legal requirement that APR is shown on lending. So the reason we use APR um, is because the lenders have to show it and it allows us to compare like with like. It allows us to compare different products um, and gives us a, a, a standardized calculation. That's why it's so important. Otherwise, different types of ways of calculating interest and charges um, could be put in place that make the products more complicated, more difficult to compare like with like. So that's what it's for, is enabling you to compare across different types of borrowing and see that cost difference. But it's also really important to look at both the monthly repayments and also that total repayment figure as it goes through. OK, quick concept for you. Um, I'm aware of the time. Um, we want to look at what priority debts are. So if somebody is in real trouble, priority debts only become important when somebody's in real trouble. But if somebody's in real trouble and they have lots of outstanding debts and they're thinking, I don't have enough money to pay all of these, which ones do I really have to pay and which ones am I going to have to put off because right now I can't manage them. It's also a thing that debt advisors look at because they're looking at who do we share the money out between um, where do we give top priority to and who do we say, look, you're lower down the scale. You're not going to get your money yet. We'll give you maybe a token payment if there's something for you. So priority debts are about where are the most severe consequences for not paying. Um, and they are the ones where you could be sent to prison, could lose a home or could be cut off from an essential service. So it's only the things where a person could be shut, cut off and where the thing they could be cut off from is an essential service. So something could go to the county court and still not be a priority debt because the county court might not be able to send a person to prison, take away their home or cut them off from essential service. So county, something, something being a county court at county court does not necessarily mean it is a priority debt. OK, so what is not a priority debt? We're... Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to um, run through this a little bit quickly. I was going to do an exercise with a poll, but I'm aware of time ticking down. So um, I'm just going to run through some of these for you uh, verbally, first of all. So priority debts. Does anybody have any ideas? First of all, stick some ideas in the chat. What do you think might be a priority debt? What might be based on what we've just said? What might be some priority debts? Uh, council tax, mortgage, yes. Um, you know what, I'm not sure in Scotland whether that is the Sheriff Court. Um, the Sheriff Court might be High Court, so I'm very sorry, I don't know for sure, but um, Citizens Advice in Scotland will have more information about that, um, and there is a, information in the booklet about uh, debt charities in Scotland and if you look at their websites they will be able to give you more information so apologies to the people in Scotland um, for my lack of immediate answers on that okay Alison popped in chat water now interestingly 
water is not a priority debt. And people often mistake this one. Electricity is a priority debt. Gas is a priority debt because you can be cut off from your electricity or gas. They cannot cut your water off, which means that although it's an essential thing to have water, water can't be cut off. So it's not a priority debt. Non-payment is not going to lead to you being cut off. Um, so it is an important thing. Utilities, fines. Fines are a priority debt. Potentially, a magistrate court fine you could be sent to prison for. Taxes, absolutely, could be sent to prison. Court fines, magistrate court fines, yes. National insurance, yes. Um, tax credits, housing benefits, overpayments. Interesting one. Um, they're often treated as priority debts if they're going to be taken from somebody's benefits. But they're a bit of a like side to side case. They're not necessarily. Um, phones and internet. Interestingly, no, not a priority debt because you can get a cheap device and a pay as you go SIM and then you don't need your phone contract. So we say, even though, yes, we really need that utility, you can get the utility without having the contract and therefore they're not a priority debt. Um, child maintenance. Child maintenance is absolutely a priority debt. You can go to prison over that. Business loans. Uh, potentially, if they're going to close your business down, um, business debt line is helpful or potentially sale. Unpaid tax, child maintenance, definitely are priority debts. Well done. TV license is a priority debt. DWP pay repayments, like I said, borderline. So well done. Um, generally speaking, I think everybody's got that one. Key ones to mention, like I said, as non-priorities that people sometimes get confused, phone and water are not treated as priority debts. Can't cut your water off and you can get a pay-as-you-go phone um, with data. So that's not treated as a priority debt. Okay. Fantastic. Well done. Well done, all of you. Let's think about some of the risks of lending to and borrowing from friends and family. What do we think of some of the issues with that? Um, informal lending, I know it goes on a lot in the fishing communities, um, and it's very tempting, but um, there are some issues with it. So you can risk relationships. Um, you can end up not getting your money back, um, falls out, stress, family breakdowns. Yeah, people stop talking to each other. Um, it, you just don't get your money, stress back, stress on relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. So on either side, right, it can put you in a position of being feeling really guilty if you've borrowed from someone, you can't, you can't pay them back. And then they struggle. That feels really bad. Um, and then on the other side, you lend money to a friend and then they don't pay you back and then are they really your friend that can feel really bad and there is indeed no recourse if it doesn't get paid back exactly so you do not re it's very difficult legally to come after money that you've lent to somebody almost impossible with friends and family and that brings us on to um, a really important next section which is about unlicensed lenders so um in some communities there are there's that guy who can lend you money or that woman who can lend you money it's not always a man um unlicensed lenders are very dangerous um and it's a really good idea to know how to spot the signs of an unlicensed lender or loan shark we only use the term loan shark here when we're talking about unlicensed lenders and the reason we're talking about the license aspect to lend money and charge interest, you have to have a license and be regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. If you don't, you're actually committing a crime. So loan sharks, it's a criminal offence to lend without a license. And the reason for that is um, often because there's actually no legal recourse to get the money back, they'll use illegal means. So threats, um, violence, kidnapping, blackmail, criminal damage, um, threatening people's families, uh, occasionally they've been known to force people into other criminal acts so that essentially it becomes an organized crime thing it's very very dodgy um, and there's often a lot of um, other sort of other crime that surrounds people who are acting as loan sharks um, these are the signs so they don't really give paperwork um, there's no record of payments no credit agreements none of the sort of stuff that allows you to understand what you've already repaid they may not give clear information about how much is still owed. Um, you think you've paid it all off and then 
oh, but you there's still all these charges from that time you were late. Okay, um, you're never allowed to fully settle the debt. Items might be taken as security. So if somebody doesn't have their passport, bank cards, driving license, that kind of thing, and it's because they've given it to somebody as security on loan, that person is a loan shark. No legitimate lender will ever do that. Um, and like I said, they can get really nasty. So this is quite, it's not illegal to lend to family. It is illegal to charge interest on money that you have lent. Um, yeah, as Tina says in the chat here, unlicensed lenders often act like they're your friend. Um, they're often very friendly until you're caught up in that web of having borrowed from them. So it's the lending with interest that causes the criminal aspect of it, right? It's not just you give somebody a tenner and then ask for it back later. But if you're expecting them to pay it back with interest, that's where it starts to become a crime. Okay, so um, signs of loan shark borrowing, budget doesn't add up and somebody doesn't want to say why, they've got a loan with no paperwork, they've got a loan to a friend um, and they're worried about not paying it. Um, you might hear the term double bubble. So if somebody is, uh, you know, they've lent you 50 quid this week and they expect 100 quid next week, which by the way, is a million percent APR. <laughs> That's double bubble. Um, if they're taking ID cards or bank cards as security, the person has no way of knowing what they're actually owed and there's no paperwork and they can't get it. And then charges constantly being added to the person feels like um, they're paying, but, uh, but somehow it just, it just never gets paid off. Clear signs of loan shark borrowing. Um, we've got a little uh, side note here that if a budget doesn't add up and they won't say why, there may also be um, either some kind of economic abuse issue going on there or an addiction issue, something else personal going on there as well. But it can also be a loan shark. Okay. And there is an enforcement team. It is a crime. There is an enforcement team. Um, there are specialist uh, teams out. Um, including undercover agents. They are a com combination of the police with um, trading standards. And they're originally based, they're based in Birmingham, but they operate across the country. People can report anonymously. You can give a tip off just for like, there's somebody acting in this particular local area. You don't have to specifically say, um, you know, who exactly told you. It all can be anonymous. And they do victim support for people, even if that person doesn't want to come forward as a witness. So um, they do a 24 7 365 service anytime, day or night. Um, you can report through these means. Um, and um, obviously, given what we've just been saying, um, people end up losing thousands and thousands of pounds to loan sharks. So if you know of one in a local community, it's really important to stop them. Um, and you can get, if you're worried about something going on in your local area and you want to kind of raise more awareness, they also have liaison officers who can come down to your local neighborhood and uh, do some community awareness raising. Um, they do free training. They can work with kind of other people in your local area who might be interested in this and might spot the signs of loan sharking as well. They give publicity materials for free. Um, and like I said, they also do the victim support for people, even those who don't want to be a witness. So really, really worth being in touch with those guys. And like we said, the details are all in your notebooks and your booklets and handouts that we've given you there. Um, in the last few minutes before we finish up, um, we want to talk about the credit unions. We've talked about the really bad guys. Let's talk about the good guys. <laughs> We've got here ComSave, who have put together a specialist offer um, for fishers and people in the fishing industry. Credit unions are not-for-profit savings and loans owned and controlled by the people who have an account, who have a savings account with them. So if you have an account with credit union, you become a part owner of the credit union. So they're fully mutual. They're fully regulated, they're authorised by the Financial Conduct Authority, they're covered by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, which means up to £85,000 worth of savings held in a credit union are fully backed by the government. Um, they're owned and controlled by members. Um, 
they will off ComSafe uh, specifically have online and telephone services. You may have a local credit union that um, may offer slightly different credit services in your local area. And then um, ComSafe specifically have put together some special products, uh, including a tax and national insurance account to help keep that money separate. Like we said, that was really important. Um, and a loan scheme to support access to government grants. So some really good stuff in there from ComSave. Well worth checking them out. Um, and I, you know, I'm a big advocate in general for membership of credit unions. Um, they're just a really great way to support people in your local community who otherwise might struggle to have a safe and affordable place to save and borrow. And they're just good to, to use as a safe place to save and borrow for anybody. So I um, highly recommend in general credit unions. I think they're a good thing. Um, and yeah, um, well worth taking a look at. And Tina has again put the link in there. It's comsave.co.uk slash fish. So you can check that out. Um, let me check if there's anything else. So again, just within that advice and guidance line, you can't say to somebody, go to ComSave, they're great, but you can say one of your options is ComSave, they have these products, these are the advantages and disadvantages. There's the contact details for ComSave, um, comsave.co.uk slash fish. We're taking a little, a good look at that. And they have a bereavement fund as well, as Tina has said in the chat there, pays out some between 500 to 5,000, depending on somebody's savings balance over the previous um 12 months so take a little look at that okay so some places where fishers can get advice lots of great websites we've already mentioned a lot of these during the course of the training already we've mentioned stop loan sharks team just now um i've already talked about turn to us as a place to look at benefits there's also entitled to they also do benefits checks as well um we've got sale and fisherman's mission always your first places to go because they are the specialists. Um, sale for debt advice, um, Fisherman's Mission potentially for um, looking at grant applications and uh, possibly benefits checks, um, but sale for debt advice, tax issues, that kind of thing. And then more broadly, just to kind of look up information about money and debt issues, um, National Debt Line is a great uh, debt self-help charity. So if somebody wants to self-help around a particular debt issue, they've got loads of letters, sort of standard template letters, loads of fact sheets. That's really useful. Um, business Deadline is a part of National Deadline specifically for small business owners. And then Step Change also has things like a debt self-help, like a checker to see whether somebody's debt is kind of beginning to get out of hand and they need to do something about it. So somebody might want to try that out. And again, lots of information about things like um, so I've got a debt collector coming round. I've, I've got this letter. What does that mean? National debt line, business debt line, step change, all have places, good places to research. Well, is, is this really serious or are they just sending me a scary letter to try and frighten me? Citizens advice, similar thing, but they also have information on housing, family law, um, uh, benefits, consumer issues as well. So really good on consumer issues. Um, and then Money Helper, if you want generic information about different types of financial products to help understand how does this product work? What does it do? What does that piece of jargon mean? Um, what's that term mean? What's this good for? Money Helper um, is an independent um, nonprofit website it's run by the government um, to give everybody more financial education and information. They've got some really good tools on there as well. So um, well worth taking a look at those. Uh, yeah. Okay, so sale we want to particularly flag up. They are a citizen's advice service specifically for seafarers. Um, very, very useful advice on benefits, debt, housing, and much more. Um, they will always be your first place to look. Um, as we said on there, relationships, family issues, consumer, debt, employment, housing, the whole shebang um, and those are the contact details and the contact details again are in that booklet that I have uh, already put in the chat once or twice I'm going to put it in there again yeah um, I think one of the key things in here is not just consolidating debts 
um, but they will also actually potentially be able to get some of the debt written off, um, arrange for token payments, that kind of thing, and it's all free. Yeah, absolutely. People should not pay for debt advice. So anybody that you're talking to should not be paying for debt advice. Always, always, always go to one of the free debt charities, ideally sale as the specialists. Um, do not pay for debt advice. Um, it is you'll get a better service by going to one of the free debt charities. Okay. Um, because they're not driven to try and put you towards the most uh, highest paying fee charging option. Um, I've already mentioned this already, national debt line, we've got a fact sheet library, sample letter library, very, very helpful. Step change, same thing. Debt information is really helpful on step change. Um, want to flag these guys up. Um, again, while sale is um, uh, the, a really great option for tax issues, um, there are um, there is tax aid as well. You might be supporting families, not just the fishers themselves. Um, and tax aid has uh, professional tax professionals who help people on lower incomes who've come across some kind of tax issue that they can't get sorted with HMRC. And tax help for older people does the same thing, but for older people. Money Helper, I've already talked about it. Loads of great information, loads of different financial products and situations. Again, well worth taking a look at. And then the Money Charity also has information on our website and a downloadable money manual, which you are welcome to take a look at, can also be really handy to keep some of those to hand. Downloadable is free. And then if you want paper copies sent out to you, I'm afraid there's a bit of a cost to that. So um, I'm aware of time. Hopefully you won't mind giving me a couple of minutes um, extra. Apologies, Harriet, but we're going to try and get through these last few slides really quickly. I want to think about what makes a successful signpost. So if you're going to point a fissure towards a new organization that's going to help them out with that, with their issues, you want to make sure you do that effectively. Otherwise, um, you will end up with them not actually going through with it. So it's possible to, you know, suggest that somebody goes to somewhere and then they never actually make that contact. So we want to make sure that we have that conversation in an effective way. Um, so here are some of the things that you want to make sure um, that you're doing in order to signpost effectively onto some of these organizations we're talking about. Number one, know how the organization really helps. So be really clear, what could this organization do to make a difference for this person? Don't try and signpost to 10 different organizations at once. People won't know where to start. Make sure you're giving really clear, simple contact details. Um, so you're not just um, you're not just giving like a big sheet of information. You're saying like, this is the number to call. Explain if as much as possible what's going to happen when they make the contact. So if you contact sale, they'll take some personal details from you. Get your permission to contact um, your landlord on your behalf. Um, and then they'll get um, the information from your landlord about how much rent you actually owe. And they'll start negotiating um, to see if we can get a payment plan in place so you can pay off what you owe at an affordable rate, for example. So you're giving clear information as far as possible. What, what's this going to be like to actually have that conversation? How to prepare for that first contact. So if there's any paperwork that somebody's going to need to prepare, um, in order to have a good conversation with the organization. Um, so, you know, for example, in that example I've just given of contacting sale about a landlord, make sure you have your landlord's contact details and any letters that they've sent you before you call sale. Have those to hand and then you know exactly what you're talking about when you, when you call sale. Do what you can to get an, an idea of timescales to get help. So some of these things you know, you can contact an organization for advice and information and help, but it is going to take a few weeks or months to resolve the issue. So explaining that it's not going to be an overnight fix um, and it can take a bit of time to get help, but actually it's worth it. Um, and, you know, they'll feel better from making the call. And the sooner they call, the sooner that help will be arriving for them. Help them to feel confident to make the call or send the email or um, whatever it is they need to do to get in touch with um, the support that they need 
and just generally to understand the topic a bit better if they have questions that you can answer first so they feel a bit more confident and they know what they're talking about then obviously do what you can okay superb so um if you can take a moment to think about what you've learned today. I'm not going to ask you to um, put this in the chat or anything, although if you want to, you can, but just think a little bit about what's the most useful thing, what anything surprised you about today's training, anything that you've learned today that you really weren't aware of. Make a note of that for yourself so that you remember it and think a bit about what you might do. Um, what are you going to put in practice first after today's training? I said, you don't have to share it. If you want to, you can. Um, and then we're going to give you a couple of minutes to do that. And uh, and then please do stick around because what Harriet has to say is going to be really great. OK, so we'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And then I will hand over to Harriet. Yeah, erring on the side of caution around advice and guidance is is wise. It is wise. It's definitely preferable to do that. Yeah, thank you very much. Everybody, I'm going to ask you to do um, one final poll for me um, and see how you are, get how you've got on since we started. So we asked your question at the beginning. We're going to ask a similar question again and see how you've got on. So if you can all fill that in for me, please, that would be great. OK, we've got a few more people to participate. Make sure you get your answers down for me, please. Last few. Get your answers into the poll, please. OK. We all good? Is that everybody? All right. Okay. So, um, excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close that. And thank you very much. Looks like we have had a definite shift towards the goods and the excellence which is fantastic. Really happy to see that. Thank you very much. I am going to stop sharing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stop my sharing here and hand over to Harriet and put myself, move my pin and put myself on mute so Harriet can go. Thanks so much, Martha. Um, if you could enable my screen sharing, that would be great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Lovely. Thanks, Martha. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, really informative um, training deck. We Mindfully Wired, which is where I'm from, helped to deliver or de develop all of the, the branding guidelines and slides, but um, actually having you deliver it was really informative. So thanks so much. Um, so yeah, I'm Harriet. I'm from Mindfully Wired Communications. Um, we are a not-for-profit communications organisation um, dealing, um, working in fisheries and the marine environment. And we have had the pleasure of working with the Seafarers Charity uh, for quite a long time now in developing the safety net, um, which is part of where this, uh, this whole training programme came from. But also there's so many other wonderful resources that we have been working on. And it's uh, launching on Monday. You might have seen a few bits and pieces going um, um, going around in the press lately because lots of things have been going on but we are officially launching on Monday and I am here to just share some of those resources so if you don't mind sticking around I know it's been a really long time and um, I won't speak for any more than 
13 minutes, um, but I'll just share what we've been up to. Okay, so I think you'll probably understand that, you know, of the kind of the what the safety net is doing, we are looking to boost the financial resilience of fishing families across the UK. And to do this, we are looking to raise awareness of encouraging and encouraging signups to the Comsafe Credit Union. You've heard all about it today. It is a really special service um, offering bespoke saving services to members of the fishing community. Um, we have a video that we're going to share with you that talks all about Comsafe and and um, I'll share that with you that share, share that with you in a minute. Um, we're providing a financial education for new entrants through training by Seafish, which actually launched earlier this week. They had their first train the trainers um, uh, training session. So all Seafish trainers will be training new entrants coming in on financial education, which is the first time it's ever happened. So it's really exciting. So obviously financial champions, you are all our financial champions. So thank you so much for giving up your time your, in your working day to sit through this training. I really hope that it has been um, informative for you. and You can kind of go away and help support your fishing communities. And the fourth kind of uh, piece of work is signposting the fishing community to a one-stop shop website. So everything that you have learned today, all of the resources, all of the links, all of the um, pieces of uh, you know, all of the organizations doing amazing things will be on this one-stop shop website. So you'll only have to go to just one place to find what you need. So safety net assets, um, which will all be available to you. So we've got a credit union film, which talks all about um, the kind of the difficulties of sometimes being a share fisher and um, how the credit union can help. We were filming with the female fisherman, Ashley Mullinger from Wales Next to Sea. She uh, did our voiceover and she has a part of the credit union. Um, so she did a bit of filming for us and we'll share that with you. We've got a full length version for Facebook, but we also have a shorter version for Twitter and Instagram. We have four posters available to download and print. They are going to be on the safety net uh, website and we really hope that you can use these download them print them off pop them up and um, you know in fishing ports or potentially coffee shop fishermen's fishing coffee shops anywhere where there is a footfall of fishers um, that will be able to see them We've got wallet cards that are going to be actually printed professionally and then distributed to Fisherman's Mission staff across the UK. We'll show you a mock-up of what they're going to look like, but they hold lots of information about key resources that are designed to help fishing communities and fishermen. Pre-written social media. So, you know, when any kind of campaign, when anything is la launching, it's always really good when you have a chorus of support. So everyone's sharing the same information at the same time. So we have written social media, we've got some great graphics and we're gonna be sharing those with you if you would like to see them um, tomorrow and if you can help share them uh, next week, that would be wonderful. Uh, the dedicated website, which I'll show you a mock-up, I'll show you, I'll show you it in a bit, and then policy briefings. So we have been um, writing some policy policy briefs for coastal MPs um, about the safety net, about the issue, um, and about how they can help and how they can get involved. And we're going to be doing that next week, and then another push around Talk Money Week. So the next slide is going to be the credit union film. So it's just two minutes. Um, so hopefully it won't take up too much of your time. Um, and I hope you do enjoy it. Working in the fishing industry. Ask anyone what it's like. They will say it's hard work, full of early mornings and late nights. There are special days you'll remember forever. And some days you wish you could forget. They will say it's pretty unpredictable. And if the prop's not turning, you're not earning. Which means sometimes you have to make a choice. Go out and risk your safety so you can pay the bills or stay tied up and earn nothing. The consequences of not going fishing, you struggle to pay your crew, support yourself and your loved ones. This can impact heavily on your life, relationships and mental health. But there is a solution. By saving regularly, you can manage your money and begin to reduce your financial worries and reduce stress. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Comsave is a credit union. 
a not-for-profit financial service offering a range of savings accounts and loans for the benefits of its members. With Comsave Credit Union, you can save as little or as much as you can afford. You can pop away a few pounds a week, or maybe a bit more if the fishing is good. To help make saving work for you, Comsave offers savings accounts with separate pots, so you can easily put money aside for a special summer holiday, those unpredictable rainy days, or your tax. If you need a loan, even for as little as 100 quid, Comsave Credit Union offers loans for just about any purpose, even if it's to fix your engine or pay unexpected bills. Working in the fishing industry doesn't have to be all or nothing. You can save regularly and safely and have access to an affordable loan when you need it and more. That way, you'll always have money for the good things in life and for the rainy days too. Set up your savings account today and become a member of Comsafe Credit Union so you can start building a financial safety net for your future. Please call 03030402660 or visit comsafe.co.uk forward slash fish to learn more. Work. Brilliant. I um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so I'm just going to reel you through all of the um, resources and what they look like, and then we can have questions um, at the end. So these are the posters. As I say, they're all available and downloadable from the website. Um, we've kind of we've um, focused on four themes. So one um, focuses on if people are worrying about the mental health and relationships. One is about saving for the future. One is about ignoring, not ignoring debt and getting on top of finances and then have, and then one about money management. So if you like all of them, then maybe download and print all of them or just one or two, but they are available on fishingsafetynet.co.uk. So this is a mock-up of the wallet cards. They um, are nice and small and they're able to fit in your wallet. They will be printed professionally and then they will be sent to Fisherman's Mission and then they'll be distributed um, hopefully to um, all of you working across the UK. So we've really focused on um, only kind of fishing industry specific support, um, which either has referrals from sale, um, like relate for relationship advice and counseling, together all sale, them there's some really good resources there little bit of information about what they do and then the direct links or phone numbers to get in contact so these are to hand out um if when you are out and about um on harbour sides so as i say we've got pre-written social media but we also have graphics um that we have created so as well as copy that goes alongside sharing the film and the website we've also got some graphics around budgeting talking about money you know the, the credit union versus bank so they're really informative posts um, and we've got a selection or a bank of information that we'll be sharing tomorrow so this is our dedicated website this is a safety web, web safety net website and you'll see it is very low on copy but very uh, full of information small little um, boxes that will take you through credit choices managing debt mental health and relationship support how to be a savvy saver um, and if you just click on the boxes then you'll get information and links there's also a resources page which is where you can download all of the PDFs, where the videos will be and where this webinar will be as well. So we're gonna put all of that on there um, for you to see. And that again will be, it's live now, but we're not sharing it until Monday. So policy briefings. So we are um, doing, as I say, a, a bit of policy brief, um, which, like, which we're going to be um, talking to coastal uh, constituencies, MPs of coastal constituencies from next week. And in the, from the Fishing Safety Net report, which was came out in 2019, there were 10 recommendations, four of which the Seafarers Charity have done an amazing job in actually, you know, putting into practice, which includes the training, the credit union. And now we're looking to the government to do their bit. Um, so we'll be putting up them under a small a bit of pressure to see what they can do, which includes um, support for new entrants, potentially a budgeting scheme, a support for pension plans, planning um, so as well as uh, making the people in their constituencies aware of the safety net 
we'll be asking them to have a look at what they can do to support the fishing industry too with their finances. So how can you help? Um, you can help in so many ways. Um, so obviously there's been so much information that you're kind of been taking in today, but if you can share the social media materials on your personal channels, we are going to be sending them to the organizations that you work for. But if you did want to share them on your personal channels, that would be amazing. Please let me know your email in the chat. We can share, or we can add you to the, to the list of um, the resources and we can send them to you. That would be really helpful. And um, just yeah, let, let us know in the chat. Use the resources, they're there for you. Um, and so just make sure you go onto the website. Signpost people, uh, you know, there's been so much information today, but all of the information that, that has been signposted today is on the website. So if you want a handy place to send people, sign them, signpost them to fishingsafetynet.co.uk. So your feedback, we would love to hear your feedback, anything that's not working or uh, you just want to share or something that you think should be on the Safety Net website, please let us know. Um, follow you can follow us on twitter on the at safety net number one um number one is in the number and you can follow seafarers on twitter as well and seafarers are on instagram or facebook so if you did not want to share it on your own um platforms and you just wanted to retweet or a reshare or wanted to pop in your stories on instagram then you can do that via seafarers and you can share on twitter via safety net and seafarers so talk, I know you guys are obviously talking and providing advice and guidance and help um, every day in your jobs. Um, and you are gonna be able to share what you've learned today with the fishing community. Um, so really the next kind of step is to be able to uh, make sure that people are finding all of this amazing resource that we have created. So please um, help them do that by um, letting them know about the fishing safety net. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for dedicating your afternoon to the safety net and your training. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. But if not, please go to fishingsafetynet.co.uk and have a look around and please follow us on Twitter.